So good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, the nonlinear geophysics focus group uh, session, uh, Lorentz lecture session. And uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to keep you in a tiny bit of suspense before we introduce uh, our uh, Lorentz speaker because we have uh, first uh, a Turcotte Award for the best PhD um, thesis that we're awarding to uh, Dr. Asam Biswas here, and he will have a, a short uh, 10 minutes, in fact, to uh, present uh, his work. And uh, so uh, just a quick introduction to him. Uh, Dr. Biswas uh, is from India and uh, did uh, MSc and BSc and PhD, uh, MSc and BSc in India in soil science. Um, he then did a PhD at University of Saskatchewan in 2011. Uh, he's currently in Cairo in Australia, and he has just got, uh, been uh, given a position at McGill University, in fact, in the Department of Natural Resources starting in May. So um, with that, I would like to present uh, Dr. Bisfas with uh, his certificate for the Turcotte Award. Board and thank you very much. Congratulations. Ten minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, for coming to this session. So I know everybody's waiting for the main Lawrence lecture, but I'll give a very quick, not four years of work, try to spend 10 minutes to talk about that. So my thesis title was Multi-Scale Controls on Spatial Patterns of Soil Water Storage in the Humic Regions of North America. So Humic Regions, a lot of people heard about. I'll show the map where it is located. Uh, over the last century, the increasing population and the changing environment and climate is creating a lot of pressure on the land use and land management. And all those changes are threatening or affecting the, our natural resources, threatening our natural resources like soil, air, water, and creating the accessibility and the quality of the water to a problem or threatening the water security. So ultimately affecting the ecosystem and the human health. Canada is by far no different from the other countries. And the different river basins in Canada has undergone a lot of changes over the last century. Saskatchewan River Basin, which is here, which is one of the largest and very important river basin in Canada. It's covering three prairie provinces, starting from Alberta, which is mainly comes under the foothill of Canadian Rockies. And then it goes all the way to Manitoba, Lake Manitoba, which is covering through the body, beautiful boreal forest. But the major area is covered within the Canadian prairies. And this Canadian prairie is covering three provinces and few provinces in the United States. It's about 775,000 kilometers square area. It's very important ecologically and hydrologically because a lot of bird population in this area during the summer and winter is a lot of the snow dominated landscape. It looks like that in the summer, which is a lot of black spots. And particularly in the winter, if you fly through there, you just see all the black dots. Those are the potholes or the small depression. Those small depression are just like a bowl. It's a very smaller one. Within one kilometer square, you can get six to 25 uh, potholes within one kilometer square area. And if you see the main landscape, it's a very hummock type thing. All the small depression and the hummocks, those are formed during the last deglaciation. So when the uh, glacier moved down and they just put all the small chunks of ice and when the small chunks of ice melted down they formed the small depression and this small depression has a very complex sequence of slopes and this those small depression often act as a very small or individual watershed micro watershed so to understand the hydrology of this prairie portal region understanding the 
distribution of the water in this kind of landscape within a pothole or within a depression, as well as over the multiple depression, is very important. And that was the reason I was inspired to do a study there. And when I was looking at what are the factors controlling the distribution of water in this area, different factors like elevation, vegetation, climate, or different processes like snow melt infiltration is affecting the distribution of water. Moreover, the heterogeneity in soil texture and structure is creating more complicated problem. But the, rea but the reality is that these spatial patterns of the controlling factors are not random. Rather, they follow a spatial pattern. And those spatial patterns of the controlling factor are reflected in the spatial pattern of soil water storage. Another issue is that this controlling factor varies at different scale, like the microbial variation goes on a millimeter scale to the climatic variation in regional scale. So all those variations at different scales make the scale dependent, uh, spatial pattern of soil water storage also scale dependent. And this spatial pattern, when I measured, I was going through the data and I see a lot of non-stationarity and non-linearity was involved in it, which is almost all the natural data is there. And that's why I connected to the non-linear geophysics and try to work, use the different geophysical technique, quantitative geophysical technique, to understand this variability. So with this keeping in mind, I wanted to examine the spatial pattern of soil water storage in the Himaki landscape of prairie pothole region. So then I was looking for the different method to deal with or to quantify the variability in this kind of landscape. So I was looking for specifically different methods. And also then using that method to examine the scale and landscape characteristics of the spatial pattern. So whether it's a different scale or a landscape scale I was looking for. And the target was there to identify what is the dominant control at different scales of the soil water storage. So I was doing a study at oh, going opposite, sorry. <laughs> uh, in an in a area is called Canadian Wildlife Services was controlled by that. It's St. Denis National Wildlife Area under Environment Canada. The landscape is very, looks very funny. It's a very small depression, but if you fly through, it will look like a flat. But if you go down there, it's just around four to five meter, or three to four meter high. It's not very, very undulating landscape, but it, in a small scale, it looks like that in a semi-arid climate. And I measured soil water using the neutron probe and time domain reflectometry for the surface layer and neutron probe all the way to 140 centimeter. So measured over, starting from my PhD in spring 2007 all the way to fall 2010. I was measuring the soil water at different times. Then when I looked at the, how similar or how dissimilar the spatial patterns are, I used the correlation, simple, first used the simple correlation analysis, pyramid rank correlation, to see how similar they are, I found so when the similarity, when I was explaining, if it is within a season, I was talking about this is an intra-season variability or inter-season similarity, or between the season and inter-season, and between the same, same time of different years, because I was doing study over four years time, then I was doing as inter-annual time. What I did find, the strongest correlation was observed at the intra-season, and then the inter-annual or the inter, uh, then the intra-season. So what does it mean to me? Like, I'm not going through any of the data or any colorful graph here. Just try to explain what it is. So when I found the spatial patterns are very similar, what does it mean? I go to the field, I see the wet location, it stays wet over the years. And if it's a dry location, it stays dry over the years, whether it's a summer, spring, or fall. So then I try to understand, OK, if the wet location is wet, dry location dry, can I identify a location that is represented around 50% or uh, average, field average soil water storage, then I try to identify that location, which location I can use it for the further monitoring or setting up a monitoring station, or even validate, like monitoring only one location, I can go for validating remote sensing measurements. Then another issue I was looking at, at what scale and what location this similarity is occurring. So I use the wavelet transform and wavelet coherency, just to mention the methods here. So I did find the similarity is very scale dependent. It goes on from different scales. So in the intra-season, within a season, they are identical at all scales. But when I see the between seasons, I saw the similarity is lost at less than 72 meter scale, which is mainly those variations in the landform elements or the microtopographical variation. They are contributing those loss of similarity. However, when I see the interannual variation was losing at a very small scale, like less than 18 meter, and I found this is mainly maybe 
due to the localized variation in soil water storage. Whereas the large-scale spatial pattern, which is greater than 72 meter, which is mainly representing the macro topographical variation or those landscape level variation, that is contributing to this more than 72 meter variation and which is present at all the time, at all the depths. So then what did I get from here? When I was using this method, I, I did get at what scale and what location this variability information are there or the similarity going on of the hydrological processes, which I can use to optimize the sampling when I'm going for doing a next sampling strategy for any of the hydrological studies or experimental design, I can use the scale information. And also, I can, I reveal the correlation, the environmental correlation between the two spatial cities because often the traditional correlation couldn't show the relationship, actual relationship between them because at multiple scales, they have the different type of correlation and the negative and positive was neutralizing each other. So with that, that was over the time how similar they are at different scale. Then I was thinking, okay, most of the soil water measurement we do at the surface level. So can I correlate to the surface to the deeper level? Because as an agriculture scientist or something, we want to know what is going on for the whole soil profile. So here what I did, I measured at different layers all the way to 140 centimeter at each 20 centimeter layer, then try to correlate how similar they are from the surface to the deeper layers. So I did a very similarity at different scales and different times of the year. So then I try to understand which, the, based on the correlation or based on the relationship, I was able to infer about the whole profile hydrological dynamics from the surface measurement, because surface measurements are easily available. But if I want to try to get the whole profile hydrological dynamics, it was easy for me to use that correlation. Then another issue, one property may dominate at another scale while not dominant at another scale. Then I was thinking, okay, can I separate out those things, those variability at multiple scales and see what is going on? I use the empirical mode decomposition. So when I separated that, I, I was able to use the scale-specific correlation. When I got the correlation, I do the scale-specific prediction. Also, I can identify the dominant control at different scales. So just to recap what I've done, uh, what is the main outcome was there? Optimize the sampling strategy and experimental design, and identify the representative, sorry, location for the monitoring. And also I did reveal the previously hidden predictive relationship between the factors and the soil water storage series. Also I got the, some inference about the de on depth from surface measurement, and identify the environmental control at different scales, which I was used to, I was able to use for scale specific prediction. With this, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me. We have time for one quick question, just to... Okay, in that case, I would like to thank you again. So I'd like to call on uh, Daniel Scherzer, who's the chair of the Lorenz Lecture Committee, to introduce the speaker. Yeah. Um, can you say this? It's on the mic. Ah. Okay. So I, I was asked by the members of the committee to say a few words uh, for, uh, for introduction, and there are two different reasons for that. Okay. Um, no, that's the last. You have to go to the first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, as you know it, uh, this uh, Lawrence lecture is related to, to has correspond to three key words. One is, of course, nonlinearity. The second one is uh, scaling, and the last one is uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> complexity. And uh, it's naturally related to the pioneer work of uh, Lawrence. Um, okay, it's not full size. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We will succeed. Okay, now I have to say a few words about a lecture which was given in 2006 by uh, Barley Nua, uh, because uh, first she gave a very impressive lecture at that time, and many of us remember it. And unfortunately, uh, we learned a few days ago that uh, suddenly she passed away uh, just on the eve of this uh, meeting. Um, just a few words about her. She graduated from École Normale Supérieure 
And uh, she worked in different places in the uh, U.S., Woodsall, and Carr, and Hawaii. And uh, since uh, 1985, she mostly worked at uh, Ifremer, which is a lar large uh, oceanographic institution in France. And uh, she was a vice director of the laboratory of, uh, physics, of uh, oceanographic physics. Um, as you know it, she made an uh, outstanding contribution to the understanding of oceanic di dynamics, especially about turbulence, uh, either with theory and large-scale simulation. Um, a collaborator proposed to, in order to look forward uh, uh, to, for a topical conference on these themes and with a spare particular emphasis on the participation of young uh, researchers. Okay, uh, looking forward means also we have to speak about the uh, Lawrence Lecture of this year, uh, 2010. And uh, it will be delivered by Eugenia Calne uh, from the University of Maryland, College Park. And it's about chaos directly, uh, how to use chaos instead of just uh, knowing that it's creating a problem with the application of breeding. Uh, Eugenia is a distinguished professor at this uh, university. And, but before that, she had been for 10 years uh, uh, director of the Environmental Modeling Center, where she made uh, several uh, contributions for the development of uh, large programs, uh, for example, for uh, reanalysis of 40, 50 years, and so on. Um, so she did, in fact, pioneer works in both fundamental science and application. Uh, our field of interest is very large because it includes data assimilation, numerical weather prediction, data assimilation, predictability, and ensemble forecast. Um, in particular, with uh, Zoltan Tort, uh, she introduced a breeding method for ensemble forecasting, and that, I believe, will be a key uh, point of her talk. And she also introduced other methods like lag uh, average forecasting, and so on. Uh, last detail I'm aware of that uh, is that her book, uh, atmospheric Modeling Data Simulation and Predictability, which was published by uh, Cambridge University Press in 2003, was sold out within a year. And I believe we are at the fifth uh, edition of this book, so a very successful one. Okay. I finish. So we would like now just to present um, Eugenia Carnier with her, uh, with her certificate. So from, on behalf of the uh, Nonlinear Geophysics Focus Group, I have a beautiful <laughs> certificate. So thank anyway, you very, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you know what the, the, the point? Uh, Are you a PC or a Mac? Uh, Mac. You're a Mac, so you're on the computer. Uh, the, oh, here it is. I am truly honored to, to be uh, uh, and, and scared to, to give uh, uh, such a, uh, an, uh, a lecture that, that has so much meaning, being named after Lorenz and, and being preceded by so many good people and by the young uh, <laughs> awardee today. So I am going to talk about uh, uh, this <laughs> in the midst of chaos. We are doing good predictions and how meteorology manages to, to beat the odds. And I want to, to, I've been very, very lucky at the University of Maryland and uh, I've been working with the weather and chaos group that uh, Cayo Ide directs now and I want to thank very much my my students uh, um, that uh, that have contributed so much, as well as colleagues like like uh, Kayo Ide and Surya Sharma. <coughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Lorenz introduced in '63, as you know, the concept of chaos, and actually York coined the name chaos, 
and uh, uh, even with a perfect model and a perfect initial conditions, we cannot forecast beyond two weeks that the, the so-called butterfly effect. But when he discovered this, it, it was only of academic interest because the forecasts were useless beyond tomorrow. <clears throat> so uh, now, now we exploit chaos with ensemble forecast and routinely produce skillful forecast for beyond the week. Uh, El, and El Nino coupled ocean atmosphere instabilities are allowing us to predict uh, a, a climate anomalies with skill of about a year. So uh, I'm going to focus now on breathing, which is a, a, a very simple method to explore and fight chaos. Sorry, this. Uh, <coughs> the pointer is running out of battery, it seems, maybe. Uh, uh, so I'm going to describe how undergraduate interns found that with breathing, they could easily predict the Lorentz regime changes and their duration. And actually, I'm going to show that, that it can be used for real systems uh, uh, for which we don't have a model. And uh, it's going to be used to predict solar wind storms. And uh, this research, weather and chaos, led to the uh, group uh, 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 development of, of the local ensemble transform Kalman filter by Hunt et al., which has been used very much, and which is my main dedication. So, the uh, very simple, uh, the main central theorem, so to speak, of, of Lorenz is that unstable systems are unpredictable, and stable systems are. Uh, are predictable. And this is a typical example of, of a forecast that, that uh, now we are able to do. And one of the tools is ensemble forecast. And this is the verification. And this is the forecast. And it's actually amazing because almost every center is, is uh, uh, of highs and lows is predicted almost perfectly, uh, and, and this is the result of uh, uh, three, three components, uh, good models, good observations, and good data assimilation, which is improving all the time. But there is a place uh, where the, the forecast has a cutoff, and the verification is, has a trough. And as a result, the winds are quite different, and they are from the ocean in the forecast and from the land. And the, that has a la large impact. We had very strong fires in, in San, uh, the Santa Ana winds uh, produced or maintained these fires uh, uh, by having wind from the land. So in, uh, we are going to start naturally with the Lorentz three-variable model, which has two regimes. And the transition between the regimes is chaotic. It's, it's not, uh, at least we learn, it's not predictable. So if we introduce uh, an infinitesimal perturbation, make two runs and introduce an infinitesimal perturbation in the initial conditions, the forecast after a while loses this old skill and becomes completely. And here is, uh, uh, I had the good fortune of attending a, a workshop that Lorenz participated in, and he gave a, a totally amazing, um, amazing lecture. But and he was 89 at that time. I think he died two or three years later. And he defined chaos in such a beautiful definition. When the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. I, sh I should say, uh, before he died, a week after, before he met some friends, and, and he said to them, well, we cannot live forever. So he was in, at peace with, <laughs> with his death in a very beautiful way. 
So the approximate present that we put here does not approximately determine the future, obviously. And this is a, a well-known picture of, uh, of Palmer that, that's very clear. He took in the at Lorenza tractor a ball and followed the ball. And if he took it in a region which is stable, in initial conditions that are stable, he was able to to follow the ball, which became an ellipse, uh, ellipsoid, for a long time. And uh, this is less stable. But if he takes the same ball here, the, the, there is obviously a, a loss of predictability. So errors with unstable initial conditions, with, so to speak, growing errors of the day, grow much faster than if, if they are stable. So we, uh, we had a, a, some, sorry, I tried to, <laughs> to put too much in the title. Uh, we had an eight-week project of, uh, which is called Research in Science and Engineering for undergraduate women in 2002. And we gave a team of four uh, RICE intern undergraduates a problem play with a famous Lorentz model and explore its predictability using breathing. Uh, uh, because breathing is a very simple method to study the growth of errors, and the students didn't have any background whatsoever in, in any of these things. So we told them, uh, imagine that you are forecasters that live in the Lorenz attractor. So everybody living in the attractor knows that there are two weather regimes, the warm and the cold regime. But what the public needs to know is when will the reg change of regime take place and, and how long they are going to last. And so can you find the forecasting rule to alert the public that there is an imminent change of regime? So uh, this, this is what we ask them to, to use on the Lorenz model. Uh, breathing is simply running the nonlinear model a second time from, from perturbed initial conditions. So uh, let's say that this is a control run, the unperturbed control forecast, and w you put a random perturbation here, and, and it doesn't grow much. And then after a while, uh, you take the difference between these two and rescale it and add it again. And then it grows faster because as, as you go on, the perturbation gets dominated by the fastest growing instabilities. And after a while, it grows. As, and, and, and the difference between the perturbed and the control run are, are called bread vectors. And they are like the local leading Lyapunov vectors. Uh, 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 it's a very easy way to get the local leading Lyapunov vectors. And you can also compute the breathing growth rate, which is uh, the, the size at, at the end of the in, uh, rescaling interval divided by the initial size, which is constant and divided by n. So we told them to, to compute this. And they did so because it, it was simple. Uh, the Lorentz model is simple. This breathing is simple. And, and then they painted, they, they colored uh, the, the, uh, the, the attractor with, with the growth rate of perturbations, of the bread vector perturbations. So this is uh, red means large bread vector growth, and blue means decay. And this was promising. So, so the, uh, looking in another way, uh, this shows the Lorenz uh, attractor with red showing fast growth, and then yellow less, and green less, and then blue decay. So just just integrating the model once for a long time, and we could and with just a single breathing cycle, we could estimate the stability of the whole attractor. So this was really very encouraging. So uh, uh, we asked the interns to paint 
the first variable x of t with the bread vector growth and and when I saw the result, I honestly <laughs> almost fainted. Uh, this, this is the result that they got. The, uh, you can see in x very clearly, in the x variable, the, the, the change in, in regime. And you can see that if, if every change of regime is, is preceded by the very strong growth rate. So uh, uh, one can derive, indeed, uh, forecasting rules for the Lorentz model that, that are very, very strong. The, uh, one is regime change, the presence of red stars indicating fast bre bre vector growth indicates that the next orbit will be the last one in the present regime. So it will go once and more and then change regime. And there is another uh, rule, which, which is how long the new regime will last. If you look, for example, here there are very few red stars and then the next regime is short, whereas here there are many red stars and the next regime is long. So one or two red stars, the next regime will be short. Several red stars, the next regime will be long-lasting. And uh, uh, Jim Hansen, who is a co-author of this paper, showed this to Lorenz. And uh, this rule surprised Lorenz himself. I, I thought that he would say, yes, of course, I did it in 1964 or something. But, but he seemed to be surprised. And they are very robust rules with skill scores of greater than 95%. Every time you have red stars, it changes regime, and, and, and you can predict the length of the regime. Now, uh, is, it, is this of any practical use? Uh, can we apply these ideas to a physical system for which we don't know the model? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, as I'm going to show. So we wrote the paper, a, a student, and uh, those two students, and, and uh, Surja Sharma, who got the Lorenz Award, or the lecture also, myself and Cayo Ide, uh, uh, breeding vectors in phase space reconstructed from time series data. Uh, the, the idea is that for many systems, we only know time series of few variables. We don't have the whole model like we have, so to speak, uh, roughly speaking, in, in for the atmosphere. So we can predict regime changes in the Lorentz model. We, we, I'm going to show you that we can predict regime changes uh, in the Lorentz model without knowing the dynamical model. So we use... Uh, two tools. One is the time delay embedding method to reconstruct the phase space, which is, uh, has been, uh, is well known. So we only know the time series of x in this experiment. We, we know nothing about y or z or the model. So we just have uh, observations of x every eight time steps. And then we use a uh, nearest neighbor breathing, which is uh, so after rescaling, we choose the closest neighbor in, the, in a similar direction as, 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 as the perturbation, and that allows us to do breathing, even though we don't know the, the model or, or all the variables. And uh, so we reconstructed the Lorentz model with the time delay embedding, where uh, uh, this is the standard uh, uh, embedding approach where we, you choose, uh, uh, in, in our case, we chose three uh, variables, x1, x2, x3, and uh, each, each of the variables is obtained by, from the original time series of x after the delay, which in this case is, is seven time steps. So let, let's look first at, at the standard uh, breathing model, and this is the a tractor with the uh, with, with standard breathing that we saw uh, indicates that the bottom where, uh, where there is a, a change of regime that has gra a large growth rate. Then we used the, here we used the, the, the full model and here we used the 
just the time series without n knowing, without integrating the, the model, but just taking a, a nearby perturbation uh, that's close from the time series. And you can see that we got very similar results. And then this one is for the embedded space using only x of t, and it looks completely different because uh, it's a diff, diff, but it has two uh, uh, dynamical regimes. <coughs> and a nearest neighbor breathing gives results similar to regular breathing with 98% correlation in the rescale growth. In the embedded case, the we do nearest neighbor breathing without any knowledge of the model and, and just knowing one of the three variables of the model. And this is the result. Uh, the ability to predict the regime changes is, is very good. The original model and the embedded model have similar skill. So here is the, the, the x uh, uh, times uh, x v v variable uh, with large growth rates indicated uh, like that, and they, they generally are very good at, at predicting regime change, although sometimes there are false alarms. This is when we do it with the same three variables, but using without using the model and just uh, uh, using nearest neighbor, and we get very similar results. And this is what we get from just the embedded seat space that doesn't know the model and only knows the, the time series of x of t. And uh, although there are some delays d due to the <laughs> delay that it has, it, it, you can see that it's working very well. So, pre and we uh, were so encouraged with this that we started doing the same using the local ensemble transform Kalman filter and, and doing uh, data simulation and the re preliminary results are even more encouraging. So we plan to apply this methodology to solar wind data assimilation if, as suggested by Chen and Sharma. So, so uh, let me s summarize so far. And, so breathing is a simple generalization of Lyapunov vectors for finite time, finite amplitude. And you just run the model twice, take the difference and rescale every so often. And it gives forecasting, uh, accurate forecasting, uh, 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 forecasting rules for the chaotic change of regime that surprised Lorenz. And it can be applied to real systems without knowing the model. At least that worked for the Lorentz model when we only gave them the, yeah. And the rest of the talk is the, that the same ideas can be applied to fight chaos in the full forecast models that have dimensions of millions rather than three, and in the atmosphere, in the ocean, in Mars, and in coupled systems. And we can also use the breathing to understand the physical mechanisms of the instabilities that create chaos. So a, m a major tool to, to fight chaos, so to speak, is ensemble forecasting. And here we have a, an example of a good ensemble with, with a, a, a positive perturbation, with a control forecast, sorry, a control forecast, and then we put positive and negative perturbations, then we can take the average of those, those uh, uh, ensembles, and then after a few days, we, can, we, can, we see what happens and we compare with the truth. And generally speaking, the average ensemble is, is much closer to the truth than the control. The, there are also many cases of a bad ensemble in which the, the the truth doesn't look like a member of the ensemble, like, like it should look. But that also gives a lot of information, for example, that there are other components in the system that are, are bad, and so it, it still gives a lot of information. And this is an example, the example that we saw 
of an ensemble average with the spread of the ensemble in colors, and the, the uh, and and this is a typical uh, operational system. And uh, here we have a, an example of a very predictable six-day forecast where we use uh, one line for each of the ensemble members. And you can see that they agree all very well and, and, and they predicted that there was going to be a blizzard here six days in advance. And uh, that, that was a historic uh, prediction because uh, the human forecasters many times had seen the forecast uh, give <laughs> a, a, a storm, a very strong storm, but after uh, the following day, the, the model would change its mind. And so they never risked giving a forecast beyond two, three days. And after they saw this, uh, the following day, they predicted for the first time a, a, a five-day uh, blizzard, which took place. It's the black line is what actually happened. And, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it was historic, I think. But obviously, the, the situation is, is very unclear here. So the predictability depends on, 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 this, on the situation and on the day. And this is an amazing figure that shows the four-day and the six-day ensemble forecast for verifying the same day. And you can see that, that it's, they are very similar. So, the errors of the day are instabilities of the background flow, and at the same verification time, the forecast uncertainties have exa the same shape. It's, 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 to me, it's very amazing. This is another example of a two and a half day forecast that, uh, of a storm that every ensemble member predicted, but, but uh, with an uncertainty. But you can see that the uncertainty is, is very low dimensional. It's basically one dimensional. So uh, this is, uh, uh, and, and here too also. So this simplicity, with, which is this local low dimensionality of the instabilities, uh, in, inspired the local ensemble transform Kalman filter that, that was done by Ott et al. and Hunt et al. And this is a five-day forecast, and if you look carefully, you can see that, that indeed the, the perturbations the, or breadth vectors, the differences are, are uh, low-dimensional. But once we go to 15 days, it, uh, 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 ja, you just have chaos. So Lorenz won. So in the rest of the talk, we, we are going to look at chaos in coupled systems that have fast and slow uh, uh, components. So the atmosphere has very fast, for example, convective clouds, we have a time scale of 20 minutes, and slow, uh, import, more Im important instabilities, uh, baroclinic or weather instabilities, which have time scales of three to seven days. And the coupled ocean atmosphere has even slower instabilities, El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO, is, uh, typical three to seven years, not days. And in order to predict this phenomena, we need to isolate the fast and the slow instabilities. We can predict ENSO and we can predict climate anomalies if we, if we, if we do these things right, we can predict ENSO a year and in advance. So breathing in a couple system is yeah, breathing again is finite amplitude, finite time instabilities of the system and are like the leading Lyapunov vectors. In, and in a couple systems, there are fast and slow modes and a linear approach, like the widely used singular vectors or even the Lyapunov vectors, which are based on using the tangent linear model, can, cannot cap capture the fast and the slow modes, can only capture the fast modes. And uh, uh, we, we worried for a while whether we could capture the slow modes, which are important. So uh, we did a, a, a coupling of the 
Lorentz model with fast equations and slow equations, where we put a time scale of 10 there to slow them down, and also a cup couple them, so, so the, the slow and the fast were coupled. And we added, so we, we had a, a slow system which we called uh, the ocean, then a, a fast system which we call tropical, very strongly coupled, and, and the, an extra tropical atmosphere with weather noise. So the, this is how they looked. The tropical ocean is curiously, most of the time, has a normal situation and then it, it goes completely different uh, uh, in an unpredictable way, like, like an ENSO. So we call this unusual uh, peaks, the ENSOs, and this is strongly coupled with a tropical atmosphere and, and that, that's also coupled to in turn to the extratropical atmosphere, but less strongly. So the extratropical atmosphere is the noise that we would like to filter out and, and we would like to concentrate on the end. So, and we did experiments that I'm not going to describe, but basically if we chose a short rescaling intervals and the small amplitude, we captured the fast modes that, that uh, agree with the Lyapunov vectors. But if we chose res long rescaling intervals, 50 steps and the large amplitude, we got the ENSO mode, so the bread vector represents the, the ocean the, uh, slow, dominated by the slow. So now I'm going to show you a few examples. In, in coupled fast, slow, uh, models, we can do breathing to isolate either the fast or the slow modes, as we showed. And for slow modes, we have to choose a, a slow variable and a long interval for rescaling. And, and this identifies coupled instabilities. And examples of this are the Madden Julian bread vectors that were obtained by Chikamoto et al. in 2008. Uh, then the NASA operational system with real observations, and Young et al. Uh, wrote uh, several papers, the first one in 2007 and, and several more, that show the characteristics of the, of the coupled uh, instabilities or bread vectors, and that they could be used to improve the forecast. And then uh, ocean in instabilities under physical mechanisms that was done by Matt Hoffman et al. and some results from Mars, just to, for variety. So this is the Chikamoto uh, 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 in, uh, uh, bread vectors for the Madden Julian instabilities, which are equatorial or tro the deep tropical and have is uh, wave number one. So if he uses an amplitude of 3.3% of the natural variability, he gets in the lower levels and in the upper levels very clear indications of the, of the instability of, of the Madden and Julian oscillation. Whereas if he takes amplitudes which are 10 times smaller, what he gets is basically individual cumulus convection, which is much faster and smaller amplitude and, and yeah, so. Uh, so, uh, the, the next question is, is, is what, how we can use the, the bread vectors and, and the shape of the errors in El Nino forecast. Uh, can be used to improve the data simulation, and it's basically related to, to ensemble common filter. The bread vectors are, are very strongly related to ensemble common filter. So the, the bread vectors are the differences between the control forecast and the perturbed runs. So should the bread vectors which appear because of instability show the shape of the growing errors? Yes, they should, and I'll show you an example. And they have the advantage that they are low computational cost, only two runs, 
they capture coupled instabilities and they improve data assimilation re related to ensemble common filter. And this is a, a, from the thesis of Xu Chi Yang and one of her papers, and it shows El Niño index that goes from uh, uh, La Niña to, to a very strong El Niño and then uh, goes to zero and then goes back to La Niña in, in around ni in 96, 97, 98. And this is before El Niño and uh, what she plots here are in color the actual one month forecast errors estimated by the data simulation from NASA and in and the the contours are the bread vectors that don't know anything about the observation so they are completely independent what the errors of course are errors because they don't verify against the new observations but the bread vectors are independent and you can see as as Time goes on as the el, mo, most of the instability is, is in the thermocline and it, it it moves towards the east and only at the end uh, appears strongly near the surface in in this case and it's very very clear that both the bread vectors that are computed totally independent from the analysis and the analysis errors. The, the forecast errors are, are very, very similar. And this is a, a, a beautiful example of, of bread vectors that appeared, uh, the, actually, the first time we tried this many, many years ago. The, there are, this is uh, the equator uh, uh, to 10, 10 north and south, and this is uh, uh, South America is here, and, and and the colors are, are the sea surface uh, temperatures. And you can see that at the equator there is a very cold tongue, and the cold tongue has instabilities which are called tropical instability <laughs> waves. That's not a very original name. And then she computed the bread vectors, and you can see how the bread vectors are growing and are, are more unstable in the northern hemisphere as they should and they are trying to break down, to, to make the, the instabilities grow and break. And I showed this at home while we were having dinner to Michael Gill, and, and, and his advice was any good student should be able to look at the energy of the bread vectors and do more research on that. And so we followed that, that uh, uh, with Matt Hoffman, uh, some years later, he, he uh, found, he uh, 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 drove uh, an ocean model with the re wind reanalysis, and, and he found uh, that without telling anything, the system, the, the system just found, did, he did breathing, and the breathing discover the instabilities on its own. So discover instabilities here, discovered in the instability here when he took a, a rescaling time of, of 10 days. But if he took a longer rescaling time, then the, these instabilities basically subsided because they, they are relatively fast and they don't last more than 10, uh, 20 days or so. But there was a, a very strong instability uh, at some times of the year. Uh, for example, in uh, just east of, of where I was born in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. And uh, so this is really exciting. We, uh, we were not even aware whether these instabilities are well known or not. And uh, so we have in in this uh, uh, i don't remember what time rescaling this but this is a case where we have uh, measured in in the u velocity we have both uh, instabilities tropical instabilities and also this south southern convergence zone and can we determine the dynamic origin of these instabilities yes if we follow 
Michael Gill's advice. So we, uh, 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 the breadth vector kinetic energy equation can be computed exactly uh, unlike what's done normally with, and I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, both the control and the perturbed solutions satisfy the model equations. So we were able, uh, Matt Hoffman was able to write a, a kinetic energy equation for the breadth vectors, and it has many, uh, several terms, and, and as, as usual, the uh, one very important term is, is the uh, baroclinic instability, which, and this term is the conversion of, uh, the conversion from potential to kinetic energy. And, and it's uh, computed for, for these areas. And you can see that in, in the tropical instabilities, the, the values are red or, or positive. So that means that pon potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. And that's what you expect because uh, <laughs> typically potential energy becomes kinetic energy. But in the second one, is, yeah, the values are negative, and that looks very surprising. But uh, it turns out, so kinetic energy becomes, uh, it, it, it's like uh, kinetic energy can convert uh, a move heavier, colder water up on, uh, according to this, and in the instability. And, and what happens is, is that, that this is associate, is driven by winds, and the winds drive currents. So what appears first is kinetic energy, and then it drives the, the potential energy. So uh, now I'm going to go very quickly over the uh, 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 Martian atmosphere uh, reanalysis project. Uh, Steve Graybush et al. Uh, published a paper on, on bread vectors computed. And this shows uh, the, the po southern pole, the south pole and the north pole. And there is, uh, in the winter season, there is a very baroclinic, uh, te these are temperature lines. And it shows uh, uh, where there are instabilities present uh, estimated by the bread vectors. And now and I'm going to just uh, uh, do a movie by hand. So you can see uh, that it, the instability started at low levels. They grow and they, they uh, move and dominate are much stronger at lower levels. And, and then uh, at the equinox, no, sorry, I don't know why it, it, it disappeared there, but Anyway, it disappears uh, as the winter goes to the so southern hemisphere. Uh, it, uh, they appear there, and then the following year, they are similar to before. So I, I'm just going to, to stop in, uh, in, uh, to finish in time, actually. <laughs> uh, so we can fight chaos and extend predictability by understanding error growth. So. Chaos is, is not random. The one, one hears the word chaotic, it seems like it's random, but it's not. It's, it's uh, physical instabilities. And breathing is simple and a powerful method to find the growth and the shape of the instabilities. These instabilities also dominate the forecast errors, uh, the, the instabilities that are dynamically induced, not, not the model deficiencies that those have are not so we can we can use breathing to to estimate the shape and improve the the data simulation and this is basically what ensemble common filter does it, it's related to breathing and it's the ultimate method to explore and beat chaos through data simulation in the chaotic Lorentz model, the growth of bread vectors predicts regime change and how long they will last. And breathing now, uh, we have shown, can be applied to a time series without knowing the model. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 
Nonlinear methods like breathing and ensemble common filter can take advantage of the saturation of fast weather noise and isolate slower instabilities. So, breath vectors predict well the evolution of slow coupled forecast errors, and breath vectors help explain the physical origin of ocean and Mars instabilities. And ensembles of breath vectors improve the the seasonal and interannual forecast skill of El Niño, especially during the spring barrier. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for a question. Michael, yes. Thank you very much. I hope to discuss it more. And uh, uh, I, I didn't realize, but but it's it, it's obviously very strong. And we didn't we had no idea about them. They they just appear naturally. Yeah, I, I'm afraid we're being thrown out of the room at the moment. So we're going to have to end this discussion now. But thank you all very much for attending, and uh, one last hand for the speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>